All right, welcome to Saints Ascending. Yeah. What, what? People who want to study the gospel in the house. <laughs> uh, so I've had this, this topic on my mind for a while about uh, tithing and alms. And uh, I haven't really pe heard people talk about some of the stuff I'm going to talk about in the way that I'm going to talk about it. And I thought it'd be a wise, a, wise, a um, valuable addition to the conversation. Um, of course, I do expect that there's going to be some people that uh, dis disagree with me. You can get into the comments and comment and tell me all about how I'm all kinds of wrong. How I am so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> lay it on me, lay it on me. Okay, so... Uh, yesterday I was out milking a cow and uh, I was listening to Sam Cooke as I often do as I milk cows and he was singing Twisting the Night Away. Twisting, twisting, everybody's feeling gay. Right, you know that song? It's just funny to hear uh, olden, olden days songs say the word gay like that because back in the olden days it used to mean, you know, you're having fun, you're having a good time, right? Uh, and, uh, of course, nowadays it, it's speaking about homosexual people, right, by and large. Um, most people don't use it to say you're having a good time. And uh, that's, I just wanted to point that out as, as an example, first of all, of how a word can remain the same, but the meaning of it can change over time. And this is kind of foundational for some of the stuff I'm getting into here. So, um, another example of that sort of phenomenon is in, with the Olympics. Uh, in the olden days, when the Olympics were in their early years, it was a bunch of dudes, only men, uh, in Greece, who uh, would compete in a handful of events, just a handful, uh, and they were butt naked, as, as you can tell <laughs> from the photograph. Uh, and uh, they also had a portion that was philo philosophical in nature, and they also did very, um, they had very few rules. Uh, it's very different than today. If you look on the right there, there's a bunch of ladies who are competing. That wasn't in the olden days Olympics. And nowadays, as you know, they've got a lot more rules and regulations and different events. They've got, um, you know, men who think they're women and all kinds of stuff uh, that's made it totally different. It's a worldwide event. Um, it bears very little resemblance to the early days uh, other than it's people competing in events in in in, um, in athletic events so that's an example of how we can look at something and go oh the olympics but the people from the early olympics if they saw the later olympics they'd be like that's not the olympics that's totally different right but we call it the olympics and that can be also an example of historical revisionism if we just assume that because we call something by the same name that it is the same as it originally was, okay? Even though it's changed. I brought this up. I thought it'd be fun to look at. This is from lds-general-conference.org and it's just fun to do where you can put in a, a word or a phrase and see how many times it was said in General Conference since the 1850s. Here I put in the, the expression covenant path. And a person might hear covenant path in the LDS church nowadays and think, oh my gosh, that must have been around forever, right? That's an old, old thing, right? But no, it's not. It's, uh, as far as the General Conference is concerned, it was never said in the 1850s. 60s, 70s. This is a decade, a decade of time each, right? You go along 100 years, 100 years of general conference wasn't said even once. You get to the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. It wasn't said until the 2000s. And you click on that and you go, oh my gosh, the first time it was said was by Elaine S. Dalton. <laughs> This is a special occasion, friends. This is, this is where you get to witness a birth, the miracle of life. The first time the covenant path was said in General Conference was by Elaine S. Dalton, who, who mentioned it. 
And I, I do remember doing research on this, and she took it from a phrase from somebody else's book. But at any rate, that's where it really kind of blossomed, first of all, with her saying it in General Conference. And then good old Detoud said it a couple times. Uh, looks like it might have been in the same talk. Um, and then you go back to... Um, frequency here and then in the next decade 106 times what boom it took off when russell and other people said it and then now we we're only in the fourth year of uh of the 2020s but it's already up to 160 times at that rate it's gonna explode it's gonna dwarf this one it's gonna be double triple you know it's in that with that trajectory trajectory it's gonna be like it said every other word in general conference right <laughs> uh, anyways i point this out just to point out uh what might be called familiarity bias where you you're just you hear something a bunch and you go oh that well that's how it's been right so I want to compare this to um, to tithing. We've heard about tithing in the LDS church and in the Christian world for a very long time. And uh, we may think that it's always been around, but I want to go back to the origins of tithing and kind of point out how, how things have changed over time. So this is, uh, first of all, in uh, we're looking at Numbers chapter 18 here. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance, for their service, which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. So this is referring to tithing. So the first bit of tithing uh, or one of the one of the tithes that the children of Israel were going to going to give, and this was uh, just so you know, um, you know I'm going to skip that actually. I'm, I'm going to talk about the next part here. So this is in Deuteronomy chapter 14, okay. And here actually I'm going to talk about what I was going to talk about right now. Going back here. Let's go back to, okay, let's go back to chapter 12, Deuteronomy chapter 12. So here is Moses, and Moses is, you know, they're going to be entering the promised land, and he's giving them a sermon about uh, what they're going to have to do in the new land. This is a part of the law of Moses. Tithing is a part of the law of Moses. I repeat, just to be annoying, it's better to err on the side of redundancy than it is to err on the side of ambiguity, right? So, tithing, as given through Moses, is a part of the law of Moses. So let's let's find out a little bit more about what tithing looked like uh, under the law of Moses. Uh, let's start actually in verse 22 of Deuteronomy chapter 14. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thy oil, and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and thou shalt go into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thy, thine household, and the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. So this one, just to kind of recap here, he's saying, okay, this tithe, you're going to um, save it up. You're going to eat it before the Lord. 
and you're gonna have uh, basically you're gonna have a big feast. You're gonna have a party, okay? And if the place that you're going that I tell you to go to is too far uh, for you to carry all your you know your wine, your oil, your herds, your flocks, just go ahead and uh, sell it. You know you can turn it into money, and then from there you're gonna be able to where when you get to where you're going buy all that stuff back and um, have a big party. You can have wine, strong drink, mm, mm, mm. Have a great time, everybody. And of course, the Levite, again, the Levite uh, had his own, is going to be given anyways to, from the other tithe. But this tithe is going to be for, um, all, for you to have a party. And then you've got this, other, and also care for the Levite again. And at the end of the three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and shalt, shalt lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come, and shall eat, and shall be, and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. So this, this is another tithe. Every three years, you're supposed to um, basically lay up a bunch of stuff within the gates and the Levite again and also strangers the fatherless and the widow so the poor people um, are going to be are able to come and just eat and be satisfied and it's going to be great so I used good old chat GPT on this and don't be a hater people it's a tool it's a tool I did this, uh, give a brief explanation about the different types of tithes practiced in the Old Testament and includes uh, scripture references. So this is kind of breaking down what I just showed to you. The Levitical tithe, given to the Levites. You've got the festival tithe. You've got the poor tithe, known as the third year tithe. And that's one of the things about this is that these, these tithes were on a rotation. Uh, this one, the first fruits, uh, it says, while not a tithe in the strict sense, the first fruits were the initial yield of crops and were offered to God. So, um, and, and you may, if you were to look this up, you'll see that there's different, even other tithes that people claim existed. Um, and then there's also Levitical tithe where you give it to the Levites and then they take a 10% and give that on. So it's like, you know, there's, there's more to it. It's very, it's complicated, okay? Uh, okay, let's move on. So the question comes up: Where did where did uh, Christian? You know, uh, maybe I'm gonna show these to you now. Where did the Christian tithes come from? Oh, you know what? I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna save this. So if you actually take the time to look this up, it's it came from the Catholics, the Catholic Church. Wait, what? Tithing as as it's practiced in the modern Christian world, by and large, you know, and people may, it, it, maybe it's not absolute because there's differences in how people practice it, but you can go back and you can look at all these different councils that took place within the Catholic Church where they decided, oh, we need to emphasize the importance of supporting the church. And then later on, they had a council where they uh, reinforced the idea of financial contributions were necessary and for the clergy to support everything. And then they decided to call it the practice of tithing. And they, uh, it, it just went on from there. And then there's other things that took place. Um, council of Macon, or I don't know how you say that. Um, promoted the idea of financial contributions to the, the church. There are all these different councils and different events that took place. And then Charlemagne got on the scene and he made it like, kind of like a, through the, through the force of the government, made it a very mandatory sort of situation. So that is really how Catholic, and, and you, show me I'm wrong, uh, but from the biblical practice of of tithing, which was given to the Levites, or you were having a party, or you're giving it directly to the poor, right? From that to modern uh, tithing, which is so different, 
What it to me it is this. <laughs> it's you could almost call it something totally different. The fact that they called it tithing, I think, was supposed to lend uh, biblical uh, credence to the fa- to the to the practice. Well, they go, yeah. Well, tithing was a biblical practice. And all the Christian church do that. Yeah, in the Old Testament, they did that. But friends, it is historical revisionism to act like it's the same flippin' thing. It, it's not the same thing. Ca- the, the Catholic version, the Christian version, the LDS version are all totally different than the original ones that were practiced among the Jews. That were practiced as a part of the law of Moses, okay? One thing I found interesting as I was going through this, I thought it'd be fun just to look this up. Uh, I remember as a missionary reading the great, uh, maybe I, I think I first read it as a missionary. Maybe I read it even before that, but it's by James E. Talmadge. And in this book, one of the things that absolutely blew me away, and this is just some online version of it that you can read through. But one of the things that blew me a bit away about this was that you could, let me see an example here, immersion, immersion substituted by sprinkling, infant baptism introduced, changes in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, fallacy of trum, transubstantiation. So basically, in that book, they could go back and say that this certain pope or the, this certain change was made at this certain time, and everything was... His, a matter of history of when they changed certain things. And the LDS church will look at that, look that and go, oh, that's apostasy, right? And uh, if you look for the word tithing in, in, this, uh, in this book, in this uh, book, it doesn't exist. If you put a, in tithe, it's uh, antithesis. Oh, that's not the word tithe, right? So yeah, it, they didn't mention tithing or, or Talmadge didn't bring up tithing at all in this book. Um, and you might ask yourself why, you know, why wasn't tithing seen as uh, an apostate practice? <laughs> so the Latter-day Saints, when we look at the Catholics, uh, and, you know, and I'm a lifelong member of the church. Um, I know how it is with Catholics in particular, where there's a lot of just eye rolling, like, oh my gosh, you sprinkle your babies. That is so not in the Bible. Don't read your Bible. Why don't you, <sighs> you people, why don't you do it right? What's your doll, right? Um, meanwhile, uh, <laughs> you know, for example, with like the doctrine of Christ, there's a lot of us going, well, why don't we live the doctrine of Christ and believe it like, it, like Jesus taught it in 3 Nephi chapter 11? Right, and uh, we're we're wondering why we're not adhering to the scriptures and doing our own thing, but it's different. It's different for LDS, right? It's different. Um, I did another little quick search on here. Let's see, what did I put on here? What similarities and differences were there between the Old Testament practice of tithing and the Catholic version? So, you know, you could also look at the agricultural deal where like. Hey, they, in the olden days, I mean, in the Old Testament, they were giving agriculture, right? And and they did a certain amount of that, I think, for a long time. They I doubt they do much of that now, maybe in some third world countries or something. But it, it's it, hopefully you see that there's been a major shift to what you could have done, um, you know, caring for the poor yourself personally to its all going to a church. Do you see that? Um, that that's that's uh, one of the major shifts that's taken place. So let's look to uh, the Book of Mormon. So those of us who believe that the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the gospel and and wonder why other things might have been added to it. Uh, I mean, other doctrines that aren't in keeping with it. We wonder. Uh, or we hold them at less value potentially, or, or perhaps possibly less true if they if they can't be confirmed by the Book of Mormon. So when you talk about the Book of Mormon and tithing, the word tithing, 
if you look for the word tithing, it's only in the Book of Mormon two times. Okay, it's in uh, Alma chapter 13. And let me see if I still have this in here. And I'm 35 chapter 24. I put in the word tithing for a search and it brings up a bunch of things, but that's not actually the case. It's just 3rd Nephi 24 and Alma 13. So let's look at Alma 13 first. So Alma 13, this section is talking about, um, you know, being a high priest and what that means, how it happens, et cetera, et cetera. And then it contains this one line. And LDS people will point at this and be like, see, 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 Abraham paid tithes. And so it's obviously the message that the Book of Mormon is giving to us that we're supposed to pay tithes to. Boom. How about that? Mic drop. Walk away. Oh, man, you burn me. You burn me. So let's look at exactly what this says here. And it was the same Melchizedek to whom Abraham paid tithes. Yea, even our father Abraham paid tithes of one-tenth part of all he possessed. So that's it. That's all it says. Now let's go to the actual story in Genesis chapter 14. And I don't want this study to be hours long, so I'm going to kind of skip over certain things and just kind of abbreviate. So these guys, Arioch, king of Elisar, Shadalomar, blah, blah, blah. These guys made war with the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah. Okay? Two different places. We always think of Sodom and Gomorrah, but it's there's a king there and a king there, right? And um, what happened was they were in a battle. They highlighted that word there. They were in a battle. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. And what happened is the, the people that were fighting against the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. So I'll just call them the bad guys, even though you could argue all sorts of people are bad guys. But uh, the bad guys took Abram's uh, brother's son and all their stuff. And so when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. Okay, so Abram went and kicked some behind with his, his, his men, right? Bada bing. They went and took care of the business and brought back everything. And so they meet, they meet up afterwards, and Melchizedek, king of Salem. So Melchizedek was a king and also a priest. Uh, it says, uh, king of Salem brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the, the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. And we, we generally uh, interpret that to mean that uh, A Abram gave him tithes, which I think would be right. Um, and the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe, lat shoe latchet, and I would not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldst say, I have made Abram rich, save only that which the which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, uh, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. So here's the story. Abram gets all the goods. Melchizedek's like, oh, blessings on you, blessings on you. And he gives him a portion of what he just took. Um, he, he, it's like, he, he's, he's, he's like, here you go. Here's some, here's some of this for you. And they call it tithes, right? I, I think that one of the, the main issues here is that we, we think tithes. Well, that's tithes like the law of Moses tithes. Friends, this is in Genesis chapter 14. 
Moses wasn't born for another, what, 500, 600 years, okay? Tithing under the law of Moses would not be invented, <laughs> was not a thing uh, for another 500, 600 years, okay? So he gave him a tenth of what he brought back. Does that mean that's a part of this law of Moses? No, no, it does not. It does not. And then you have this, this thing here where the king's like, oh man, just give me, who does he say? Just give, give me the person. So take the people, but just keep all the, all the stuff, okay, Abram? And Abram is like, hey, I told God that I'm not going to take anything from you. And he says, I'm not going to take a thread or even a shoe latchet that is thine because I don't want you saying that you made me rich, right? You can just imagine uh, the king of Sodom going like, yeah, I'm responsible for making Abram rich. It's me, you know. So he did not want that. And so he, he says, hey, let the guys who went with me into this war, let them take whatever their portion is, but I'm not taking anything. So that's, a, that's how that went down. To say that this that he even took any possession, uh, uh, ownership of anything that he got in the spoils of war is, is debatable, isn't it? Right? To say that he was like, yeah, this is mine. You know, he's like, I'm not going to take any of this. I, I mean, you take what you're going to take. Here's some for Melchizedek, but I'm not, I'm not taking anything. Um, to say that this is like the modern practice of tithing is a reach. Okay. Next, oh, actually, let's do this. Let's go back. Oh, wait, I did the wrong one. Let's go back here to 3524. So 3524, this is the other one that people go, will a man rob God, yet ye have robbed me, All right? This is, that's in this portion. So here you've got uh, Malachi chapter 3 in chapter 24 of 3524. And then the next uh, chapter, you've got chapter 25, which covers, uh, oops, sorry, uh, Malachi chapter 4. Okay, Malachi chapter 4. So let's back up just a hair and let's look at the context. So Jesus is talking to them about Isaiah, first of all. All things that he's spoken have been and shall be, right? Right? All things he's spoken, and that is, uh, he says, Who so no, 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 no. search the prophets for many there be that testify of these things. And it could be that uh, I, I would say that there would be old and new fulfillments of a lot of Malachi as well, right? Um, but let's let's look at this uh, as we go down. Oh, if you remember in here too, there was that part about Samuel the Lamanite. He's like, hey, where's that part about Sam what Samuel wrote about the saints rising from the dead and didn't happen? And okay. And then we get to verse 14. And now it came to pass that when Jesus had expounded all the scriptures in one, which they had written, he commanded them that they should teach the things which he had expounded unto them. So that's what they were supposed to do. Share the things that I just shared with you. Teach the things that has taught you. And then we go into chapter uh, 24 of 3 Nephi 24. Um, I'm sorry, 3 Nephi chapter 24. <laughs> and it came to pass that he commanded them that they should write the words which the Father had given unto Malachi, which he should tell unto them. And it came to pass that after they were written, he expounded them. So, um, so they didn't have the words of Malachi because... Malachi came after Lehi left Jerusalem. Okay, he was a later prophet. So they, they didn't have any of these words. <clears throat> they might have had some of the words by way of tradition. Uh, maybe Malachi may have repeated certain things that he heard from other places as well. Uh, it's hard to say, but there are other spaces, places in the Book of Mormon that sure sound Malachi-ish, um, which that's another story for another day. But... Um, so he goes through, uh, I don't know if this is verbatim, but it, it's got to be very, very close to the King James Version of Malachi chapter 3. Uh, I'm not sure if there's words that are different or what, but as you go through it, it goes into this, 
um, will a man rob God, but you have, um, you're cursed with a curse for you rob me, even this whole nation, that, that portion. And this is, is used ad nauseum by Christians to say, that's why y'all need to pay tithing. You, you, you rob God if you're not giving the church money, right? Now, of course, the, the issue with that, for anyone who's actually read Malachi from the beginning to the end, um, if you're willing to take an honest look at it um, and read it as a sermon and set aside the uh, what could be considered artificial breaks in the sermon of chapters and verses, you realize that it's one, one big body of a sermon that you need to take it all as a whole. And uh, along the way, he says, now I'm going to talk to the, the priests, right? And he castigates the priests for all the bad stuff they're doing. And I will admit, okay, I will admit that um, this portion about uh, will a man rob God, yet you, you've robbed me, but you say, wherein have we robbed the in tithes and offerings? That there are people that in, um, interpret this in different ways. Um, I believe from my studies uh, and looking at the root texts and uh, other translations that how this should read is, Will a man rob God? Yet ye priests have robbed me. Yet ye say, Wherein have we, the priests, robbed thee? Uh, in tithes and offerings. Ye, the priests, are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me. You priests have even robbed this whole nation. This part, this even this whole nation, is where people say, oh, it's saying the whole nation of people also are robbing God by not paying uh, tithes. But at any rate, um, one of the things that makes this difficult is he only puts chapter 3 in here. He doesn't include the part about, oh, I'm talking to the priests now, in, in, back in you know the former chapter. So, um, and people that don't take the time to actually read things in context, just take what the, their churches say is, you know, oh, we got to give till it hurts, tithes and offerings, right? Uh, so, it goes on though, and I want to point out the next chapter. Uh, the next chapter gets into, uh, there's a whole bunch in, in, actually in that last chapter and this chapter, that is a bunch of like last days event stuff too. You know, the, uh, the day cometh that shall burn them up. Um, you know, it's just the day of the Lord and all these. You know, it's a lot of this like last days illusions. So then it says, and now it came to pass that when Jesus had told these things, uh, he expounded them unto the multitude and he did expound all things unto them, both great and small. So he expounded them. He shared the scriptures and then told them what they meant. Uh, okay, let's read on. And he saith, These scriptures which ye had not with you, like I mentioned, the Father commanded that I should give unto you, for it was wisdom in him that they should be given unto future generations. Generations can mean a lot of things, right? If you want to be confused about what a word means, <laughs> look up generations, because a generation can be like, you know, uh, a decade, it could be like, uh, it could be like fairly short. I mean, it could be a short time. It could be like the next uh, children that are born. That I'm just telling you, if you look at the, the, the definitions, it can mean lots of things. And he did expound all things, even from the beginning, even until the time that he should come in his glory. Yea, even all things which should come upon the face of the earth, even until the element should be, should melt with fervent heat. And the earth should be wrapped together as a scroll, and the heavens and the earth should pass away. So he gets into, oh, I want to read this too. And now there cannot be written in this book even a hundredth part of the things which Jesus did truly teach unto the people. So who knows what he said, other than that it sure seems like he's expounding about all these last days things. And so really, maybe his emphasis in sharing this last chapter was, uh, the last two chapters about... Um, you know, uh, Malachi was to talk about a lot of last day's events that are going to take place uh, so that they, they would be aware of them. And also for us, now the, the thing is, is we, we as the modern reader have Malachi. And um, so it's good for us to be given them again, right? Why not? Um, but uh, it may be that it was especially needed for them and for their future generations. And as we read on, 
and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of put forward a an idea about why their generation might need to know about this. There cannot be written in this book even a hundredth part of the thing. Um, about this. Oh my gosh, I'm skipping around here. Um, about uh, the um, will a man rob God and that sort of thing. Why would they need to know about that? Well, I'll tell you what. In the near future, they start to have priests that are going to rob God. So they had these people had all things in common, and they formed a church of Christ. Okay. Now let's kind of skip ahead here. And I'm going to get into another part that I think will drive home some of this point that I'm saying here. Over to good old 4th Nephi. Russell M. Nelson just uh, gave a Enzyme article. Oh, not Enzyme. What is that name? Oh, Leahona article now. Um, about 4th Nephi chapter 1 comparing the church to the church of Christ that exists here. Which, which I find ironic and kind of funny. But... So they formed a church of Christ, and there they had no contentions, no disputations. They dealt justly. They had all things in common among them. This is seen as the as a Zion, a Zion people, right? If if people are going to talk about Zion, when have, has there ever been Zion, right? They look to this. Um, they were having mighty miracles. They. You know, they, they had no contention in the land, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it even says in here that uh, uh, they, they were, um, you know, the, the um, I guess they were, <laughs> look at this, they were uh, given in marriage and uh, they, they were a happy people, right? Never there been a happier people. Surely there could not be a happier people among all the people who have been created by the hand of God. Okay. Um, and I want to point this out, and I will get back to this probably again. And they did not walk any more after the performances and ordinances of the law of Moses, but they did walk after the commandments which they had received from their Lord and their God, continuing in fasting and prayer, and in meeting together oft both to pray and to hear the word of the Lord. So they didn't do the law of Moses anymore. My friends, tithing is a part of the law of Moses. So if you're going to look at this this uh, previous, uh, you know, the chapter I was just at, saying that uh, <laughs> that oh in Zion we're gonna we're gonna be uh, paying tithing. Tithing is a Zion Zion people thing, and uh, and such. I mean, it's just not not a part of what these people were doing. Um, then they started to have problems. Uh, in the church, they broke, they had a hierarchical system. And then it says, they were led by many priests and false prophets to build up many churches and to do all manner of iniquity. And then it says later on, oh, crud, did I miss that? Oh, they began to build up churches unto themselves to get gain. Womp, womp, womp. So, there's a good chance that the Lord wanted these people back here to know about how the priests might steal from the people to, uh, you know, to uh, better their own situation because it was going to happen in short order to them, right? So just saying, that's a definitely, definitely a possibility. Let's go ahead and move on to let's see here oh i actually opened up these windows already didn't i let's talk about jesus's teachings jesus appears to the nephites right and he he gives what's just like the sermon on the mount with minor differences right and in chapter 3 i'm sorry chapter 13 of third nephi this is what it says about caring for the poor. Verily, verily, I say, unto you, I say that I would that ye should do alms unto the poor. But take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of men, seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father who is in heaven. 
Therefore, when you shall do your alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as will hypocrite, hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father who seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. That is it. There's nothing else in this sermon that is about caring for the poor or about giving money to the synagogue to build more synagogues, to build temples, to build anything, to... Uh, you know, to give money to the apostles, to nothing like that. The only thing that's in here that's it could be constru construed that I've seen, and we've proved me wrong, is is this that we should be giving our alms to the poor, and this is, and I would say this too. I would I would contend that alms, scripturally, is a very one on one sort of a thing. Originally. Um, I think that the the word has uh, uh, morphed over the years, and a lot of churches use it as a oh, give your alms to the church to give to the poor, um, and they use that that word that way. But if you look like you know, think about say Peter, Peter when he's uh, entering the the temple, I believe, and he's and alms were asked of him, and he says, you know, uh, silver and gold have I none, but rise up take your bed and walk, you know? So, um, he was asked alms. He was asked to give something to this guy directly. Now, when you get through this sermon, let's see what he says. Uh, now it came to pass that when Jesus had ended these sayings, he cast his eyes round about on the multitude and said unto them, behold, Ye have heard the things which I have taught before I ascended to my Father. Therefore, whoso remembereth these sayings of mine and doeth them, him will I raise up at the last day. These sayings, these sayings that he just said, these are the sayings that if we do, and I think it's safe to apply them to us, these are the things uh, that will he that will have him ra raises up the last day. Third Nephi chapter fifteen is redundant in this mat in this matter. He drives home the law is fulfilled that was given to Moses. It hath an end. The law which was given unto Moses hath an end in me. Behold, I have given unto you the commandments. Therefore, keep my commandments. And this is the law and the prophets, for they truly testified of me. These are the these are the commandments that you're supposed to keep now. Not the law of Moses. I've changed the things for you. No more law of Moses for you. Okay? And then it reminded us, like I pointed out in 4th Nephi. Remember what it said? They did not walk any more after the performances and the or and ordinances of the law of Moses. But they did walk after the commandments which they had received from the Lord their God and their God, continuing in fasting, prayer, etc. So they did not keep the law of Moses. They did not keep tithing. There is nothing, there's no evidence that they kept tithing. What they would have kept is the new law that they were given, which was alms. Alms. And also they had all things in common, right? Let's let's uh, look at this here. Th section one nineteen. So this is this is where I probably will make some people upset with me. I do not believe everything that came from Joseph Smith is inspired, and I tend to not believe section one nineteen is inspired um, because just just I, I'm gonna speak rather candid with a lot of candor here why in the crud would jesus tell us to do alms in the book of mormon which would end and 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 yeah which which for us like we we don't live under this law of moses right why would there be a revelation to bring back tithing and not just tithing but the christian version of tithing 
that has nothing to do with giving money to the Levites, that has nothing to do with, um, you know, having a party one year, that has, no, that has nothing to do with the Law of Moses version of it, that is like some newfangled idea that also goes by the name tithing. But if you do believe, if you're like, no, 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 you're out, you're off the rails. It definitely, it definitely is something we're supposed to keep now, right? If you go through this this section, it, it's um, it, it depends on how how you define this Zion, the laying of the foundation of Zion, and and if you look at this this section, it it's. Verily I say unto you, it shall come to pass that all those who gather unto the land of Zion shall be tithed of their surplus properties. Friends, we don't live in Zion, in a physical land of Zion. If you want to say that Zion is all of North America, well, I guess, you know, or the other lands, but they, they people are paying tithing in other lands, you know. I just, I just don't, I think that a Zion people, you know, uh, they'll be following Christ's law, which is alms, not the, not the, uh, regurgitated, uh, uh, version that came originally from the Catholic church of tithing into something else. And there's a whole bunch of other issues that I have with this that like it, you say you pay tithing to the LDS church right now, but the problem is, do you, um, do you give all everything to the, uh, do you give all of your surplus property to the hands of the bishop and then start paying tithing on the surplus of your surplus property? Um, anyways, it, it just, just know that whatever you think section 119 says, it might not say what you think it says. And, um, and I, I have serious doubts about why would we be paying tithing when, um, the book of Mormon teaches otherwise, like I mentioned earlier, as far as the doctrine of Christ, there's a lot of us that are or different. There are different doctrines. So we might talk about baptizing dead people or we might, I mean, or, you know, baptisms for the dead, or we might talk about, uh, let's think uh, other doctrines, uh, tithing the poor or, um, baptism, baptizing little children, or, you know, there's a bunch of these different doctrines that we go, well, the book of Mormon teaches against that, but we do it now. And we, we might fight against those, those things. But uh, for some reason, tithing is one that we, we don't fight as being wrong. And I guess that's largely because Joseph Smith, I don't know if anybody really refutes that he was behind Section 119. Um, I, don't, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say he didn't bring this forward. But personally, I, I do not hold it as more binding than what Jesus taught me to pay alms in the um in the book of mormon so this is kind of my closing statement here hopefully i didn't go too long here and um lose you but uh, these were kind of my main points i just kind of wrote them out as as summation here number one modern christian tithing bears little resemblance to the biblical practice we have no levites to support there's no annual rotation to whom uh to whom it is to be given to we have no feast tithe. Much of it was given directly to the people in need, not through a church. I mean, it's just on and on. There's these different differences that make it so different that it's like, why do we even call it tithing? Number two, the Catholic Church is the origin of the modern practice of Christian tithing through a series of councils that they held. If we reject the Catholic Church's doctrinal innovations, right? Oh, they're so apostate. Why would this one be any different? And I would say the reason it's different is because of one section 19 in the, in the LDS psyche. If we didn't have section 119, I bet you people would be beaten up on tithing. Number three, Jesus under his new law taught alms, not tithing. In the Book of Mormon, he, he clearly taught the end of the law of Moses, which tithing is from. Tithing is from the law of Moses. And what, what, what is required from him is alms. Number four, 
The two references in the Book of Mormon and about Book of Mormon about tithing cannot be used as evidence that Christians under under Christ's new law are to pay tithing. Number five, the people in a Zion, Book of Mormon Zion did not practice tithing. I mean, there's no evidence of it. There's evidence to the contrary. Why would the Lord bring back the Catholic Catholic version of tithing for now or Zion? I believe He wouldn't. So once again, if you uh, feel I'm in error, I invite you to correct me, and I uh, in, invite a conversation about this. You have yourself a wonderful day. Oh, goodbye.